bit of network issues, but we're back up now. Of course, myself, Capitalist, joined by Ten Blitz. Seconds. Blitz, game one, you want to give us a little recap on how that went for anybody who's just now joining us? Five sure. Seconds. For the majority of the game, Team Secret were up 7-5, to five, which I think is a little bit deceptive, but they ended up being ahead by like 10k gold. They just consistently Team outfarmed uh, Team Fnatic and... It was a pretty dominant performance by Secret, but Fnatic did show us some pretty interesting new stuff. The way that they built their heroes, the skill builds, I thought were at least a welcome change to the norm that we normally see. Yeah, I think that uh, I don't want to like shut down Fnatic too much because... They do have some very talented players on their team. I mean, this this team is full of like old school legends, and it, it's just unfortunate seeing them now be in a position where I just don't think they can take Team Secret in just a straight up regular game. So I do think that they need to do some interesting decisions like what they chose in game number one. They need to try and I think be a little bit more focused in their strategy, um, such as, I, I mean, they didn't really act on it necessarily, maybe because they didn't see the openings, but we kind of agreed that it felt like they were focusing their strategy very much on, you know, being able to win, you know, this one area of the game. In this case, it was kind of like the 15 minute fights, right? I feel like they need to do something like that. They need to do something targeted in order to get through Team Secret's defense. Because as we can see, especially from that game one, just left to kind of an even in even game, Team Secret are naturally just going to outplay Fnatic. And uh, you can see from just no action happening, them being able to get a 5,000 gold lead every you know seven or eight minutes um, just kind of showed the Team Secret were always in control of the game. Yeah, I actually think Mushi just has to cut loose. And I think he's one of those players that um, Secret actually did a really good job of neutralizing. Like, they put him in a matchup where it was Wind Ranger against a Viper. Wind Ranger can't really win that matchup, and that's what we saw. Like, even with the help of Johnny rotating over, he yeah. wasn't really able to do anything. And I think that was Secret's plan from the get-go. Pick a hero like Viper, frustrate Mushi, just slow him down as much as we can. Because in my opinion, I think that Mushi is one of the, I'd say like 10 or so players that if you have to consider actual sports he's kind of like that superstar that you want that can single-handedly turn your fortunes and just win a game by his performance right yeah so they did secret i feel like the game plan was just to neutralize that as much as possible and they did a good job but going over the picks and bans we see a uh, shadow fiend ban this time by secret that's i feel like that's just an obvious ban if you're dire you ban sf like regardless of what position you're in because radiant side shadow fiend is just too strong Right. We saw it last game, we see it this game. And on the flip side, Fnatic, they go with... This time they ban the Dazzle again, right? Mm -hmm. And they ban the uh, Leshrac. And I think that the Leshrac is an obvious ban for a team that has first pick. And I think the Dazzle is just one of those bans, like, you don't want to give up Dazzle or Keeper of the Light in the second round. Mm -hmm. And that's what... I mean, we talked about it last game, right? About yep. how good the Keeper of the Light is on Team Secret. And they take it immediately. No no hesitation this time. Why do you think they ban away the Clockwork? Um, is it because they have the idea that they're going to go for Keeper of the Light and Keeper is rather susceptible to the Clockwork? Or do you feel that um, maybe it's just Ohio... It, it just Ohio's a naturally good clockwork. Like he's he's incredibly good on that offlane. He's a great uh, playmaker. So they feel like they would be most threatened by a very early aggressive offlane position. If you think about it like this, um, they're most likely it's it's actually like a back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. This is really interesting because you ban the the clockwork because they're two top tier offlaners. It's the tusk and the clockwork, right? Yeah. The Clockwork doesn't do too well against Queen of Pain, so I think there's some merit to be said where they're hoping, um, you know, you ban the Clock and then you leave something in, like, the Dazzle or something like that, and right. then you're able to go that direction. Like, I think it just frees up the draft a lot, and it gives you a premier option. Because by banning um, the Clockwork out, you know, it's pretty much like Fnatic has to ban, you know, either the Tusk to give themselves, like, a better chance at having a more favorable offlane, or they, you know, they went with the route of banning Dazzle, and so Secret gets something that they want. Either they get the Queen of Pain or they get the Tusk, so they're happy regardless. Right. Our second set of bands now, the Witch Doctor as well as the Bounty Hunter, going to be banned away by Team Secret Fanatic, are going to take away remaining. the Viper to start things out. Now, uh, the bands from Team Secret make a lot of sense. The Witch Doctor is... Fanatics. 
pretty problematic, I would say, for any kind of grouping mechanism, such as what the Tusk brings with his Snowball. And then the Bounty Hunter um, is kind of known, like we've seen even first pick Bounty Hunters in the Wild Card series, where um, Bounty Hunter does have a lot of value right now because he's an incredibly unique kind of hero playstyle-wise in the first 15 minutes. He forces the enemy team to do a lot, both in drafting and play in the first 10. Yeah, it's just one of those Ten heroes that remaining. also, like, going back to having like Mushi or something get a really good start. Mm -hmm. You're just one of those heroes that can completely turn your fortunes around and equalize everything. We've seen it time and time again, right? Bounty gets off to a good start, they just dominate because you, you spend so much gold trying to prevent him from doing bounty things. Right. Like, it's just a little bit too difficult. And uh, Fnatic are going to pick up the Bane. He is just a good hero overall. It's one of the better counters to the heroes that Fnatic already have. Um, why, why do you say, is it, is it the defensive sleep? Remaining. Is is that why it's a good hero? Because I I am I'm actually Five disagreeing. I I just don't really see much of a point of a, of a bane here. He's not a very popular support hero through the meta, and the only team that really ran it successfully recently was really Cloud Nine. Yeah, I I feel like it just because that misery is such a good bane. It's just one of those heroes that um, it prevents you from going a lot of the directions that you want to go on if you're secret. Like okay. it's just a hero that's good against, for example, mobility. Like, you can take away, yeah, like, if you're a Storm, for example, against a Bane, the Bane can just lock him down for so long. It's right. not even just the fact that you can kill him using the Fane's Grip. Like, it's a sleep timer that's just irritating. It's okay. just the fact that you can potentially have a 3v5 or a 4v5 fight with Bane, right? You just mm -hmm. max out the sleep, sleep one hero. Even if they get woken up, that's another hero. Like, you're taking somebody out of the fight, whereas you can continue to maneuver. And it's just a hero that goes through BKB, so it's always going to be warranted. The thing about the hero, though, it is very feast or famine. Like, you either get a good start, and you start to roll with Bane, which right. is what we saw with C9, right? That's the type of player that uh, Misery is. But if this hero doesn't have a good start, then it just almost falls off the map completely. And, oh. Bloodseeker now picked up. Um, you talk about neutralizing a hero, which is something that Bane does quite well with both his sleep and his fiend script. Now you've got another sort of a neutralizing ability with the rupture from Bloodseeker. Um, this is very interesting as well because we have now a third core on the table or a potential greedy four position Bloodseeker. Um, there is the the reason I say there's a possibility that it's a core because they fanatic can run something aggressively here, right? And leave gyrocopter like safe lane solo, or, or sorry, bloodseeker safe lane solo, and run an aggro tribe with gyro. Yeah, I think actually the bloodseeker is going to be. I really feel like it should be a Mushi hero because it's one of those heroes I feel like just has the potential to snowball so hard. Mm -hmm. Like I think he, I think he wants to be in a position where the game rests on his shoulders. I think that's he's kind of unique in this day and age in that regard. Like yeah. a lot of teams like to play the team aspect angle, but I feel like Mushi's still one of those players that wants the game on, you know, his performance a lot. Right. And so I feel like, it, and Bloodseeker almost perfectly fits that bill. And so I think that I would like to see him on that. I, I do like Secrets Pick so far though. Like they've got heroes that they're pretty iconic for in this patch, right? And so they- And I think the... they have also left their draft very open-ended. Yes. Like, you could go anything for your last two. That, that, but that being said, there is slight downside. Um, it is so open-ended because of the fact that your first three are facilitators. They aren't necessarily damage dealers in themselves. Even Tusk as a, a core position, I would say, is more of a facilitator for other people to do work rather than him, you know, carrying the game himself. So I feel like there, there is a lack of um, power coming from these first three pickups and this leaves a lot of the damage being focused on the last two which i do feel like fanatic with the like the sort of idea between the three four like being able to have neutralizers essentially the bane and the, the blood seeker particularly the bane i mean if you know you're only dealing with two primary sources for damage two heroes that you really need to focus down um and bane is already taken able to take out one of them fanatic could be in a very good good position in in that regard yeah, I actually, and again, we are seeing it again too, Ten by the way, the counter, it's like, if you can't get Viper, how often have we seen this? Like, I think the last, like, three Five games, yep. New Cassid, you don't get the Viper, you take the Razor. They're just game-winning heroes. Like, they're not the most fun, they're not really too flashy, but, I mean, they win you games, they're very solid. They're just lane, it's just a lane-dominating hero. Like, yeah. you can't really go wrong with a Viper or a Razor. 
Because A, they're really tanky, B, they harass out better than any hero, and I'm pretty sure that's an S4 racer. I think they're thinking the same thing I am. It's going to be the Bloodseeker mid. What beats that? Not a lot of heroes can just outright harass him, so just steal his damage. Mm -hmm. And even if you put the Queen of Pain mid, the Razor should be able to win. Right, so you're kind of guaranteeing that the mid lane is one. Razor, like going into the mid to late game, is a pretty good counter versus both the Bloodseeker and the Gyrocopter. Bloodseeker is a melee hero, so naturally um, you're going to have some advantage there, though not as much as you would have over many other melees because Bloodseeker is super fast. Um, but uh, the Gyrocopter as well. Um, the Gyrocopter stealing away his damage, especially like early on when he has just some stats and BKB. He's, his, his physical damage is a little bit limited, uh, but it also can do a decent amount of impact with that flat cannon. If you take away, say, 20 damage away from the Gyrocopter before the first flat cannon shot, you've taken not just 20 damage away from him, but 100 damage, right? Because he's he's hoping to be able to hit five heroes with that flat cannon shot. Um, so I think that that's sort of the way that uh, flat cannon amplifies the physical damage you have already. So too does Razor really negate that advantage um, quite easily. Now, the Undyne was the last pickup. I love that. A lot of team fight, especially since you already had some good holding heroes with the Bane and the Bloodseeker, so the Tombstone is very powerful here. But Team Secret are now going to go for the Clinks, which is going to be a very nice single target focused hero that I think is actually good versus almost all of these heroes on the side of Fnatic. Um, I think it's particularly strong against the cores of Bull Gyrocopter and Bloodseeker. Yeah. Did you see the hero I was hovering over for uh, they picked it? No. Huh. Oh, I, I hovered over the Weaver because I thought. You, if you're secret, I just forget about heroes sometimes. If you're secret, what do you need as your last hero? Like considering the what you already have, you already had. You need a hero that can hit high ground. Like you just need heroes sure. that can hit buildings. Like I think we were talking about it at the end of the C9 game. It's like Ember's a good hero, Ten sure. So is Gyrocopter, but neither of them are the heroes that you want to send in the front line. Lines to just seconds, hit buildings, remaining. particularly Ember Spirit. He, like he doesn't hit buildings ever. He sits in the back and slides a fits you, uh, fight, fits you every single time. But he can't actually get up and and, yeah, and take out those hold. buildings for you. But yeah. Clinks certainly can, because Clinks is uh, first of all a lot of physical damage, a lot of single for target focus, both when it comes to heroes as well as buildings. In fact, you could say so more more so for buildings than anything else, um, but is also like quite tanky thanks to um, Death Pact. When you are the one controlling when the team fights are happening, Klinx is actually decently tanky because you're obviously going to work that push in with your Death Pact timing. Yeah, like I think, I think that's completely true overall. And so... Um... Both teams, I mean, it doesn't look like they're heading into each other or anything like that. I think that they're just scouting out. Um, judging by the item builds, it's actually possible that they decide that, uh, maybe not. They could just try to battle. get aggressive early on if they anticipate the Undying to be the dual offlane. Right. I think it'll be, yeah, because Ohio's already in position. That means Mushi's caught mid. Okay. It's one, it had to be one of those two, I guess. They'll probably do then Undying plus Bloodseeker offlane, and you probably want to dodge that because the Gyro plus Bane is a lot more easy to deal with, I feel. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, generally speaking, you just don't want to fight into the Undying at all, but if you manage to, yes, you successfully dodge it in the first minute, say, um, you manage to get a, a, a single offlaner up against the dual aggression of the Undying plus one. Um, but then the Undying just rotates bottom lane. Aren't you stuck in a bad position at that point? Uh, because now you're faced tri-lane versus tri-lane, and then you you are then the one forced to rotate. But you still want you still want them to react to you more okay. than anything. Like, but I think this is like some weird tricky game because both teams are reading each other before anything actually happens. Like Fnatic is going for the counterplay, and then they get counterplayed because it's a little bit too obvious. So now Secret is going to, you know, it's just like a back and forth mind game because you originally saw the Undying at top, right? Uh, because they might have anticipated some sort of dueling. So now you're going to see the TPs. Like now that you force Fnatic down, then you force yourself down because you can't just leave Arteezy in a situation where he's oh, one on one. Ohio. He's going to be kind of caught here. Actually, turns around to go for one of the last right clicks on a creep in order to heal himself up. But the last right click from Arteezy isn't quite enough. Zai does have another ice shards coming up in a second, but he just runs down the Bloodseeker, who actually kind of slowed himself down by running into those trees. And Zai is the one to pick up the first blood. So, uh, unfortunately for Fnatic, it seems like them forcing Arteezy to rotate actually turns out quite well for Secret. 
it was so unlucky for Ohio. He had the Blood Rage on him. Oh, and they're actually going to go on him again. And is he blocked off from this? The and creeps are blocking him quite heavily. Zai is trying to get in front of him as well, but Ohio will live. Seems that poor man shield do, uh, does do a decent amount of work. Johnny's going to pass over his potion, so Ohio stays in the lane for the time being. And now Johnny's going to try and help out this Bloodseeker by harassing Arteezy down a bit. This is so miserable for a Klinks against an Undying because you already have such a terrible HP pool to begin with. Mm -hmm. Still losing your strength, like 17 minus 4. He's already at 378 HP. At the same time, there there is some validity to the fact that Fnatic don't actually have any nuking power to take advantage of that. Plus the fact that while he does drop low in HP, percentage-wise, he's not low, right? So Bloodseeker isn't actually getting a big benefit out of Thirst. Yeah, but you still don't want to be a... He said 302 health right now. Like if he gets right click <laughs> once by Bloodseeker, you, yeah. you've played against it before. You get hit once by Bloodseeker and like, mm -hmm. and you're that low, then you just die because he can just chase you down. He doesn't really yeah. care if the Rubik's there or not. Once he gets a, a level or two of thirst, then I'm pretty sure he's just going to try to run on Arteezy. And that's the play. And in the mid game, they have a ton of bursts. I mean, they've got the Queen of Pain ultimate. Like if Arteezy isn't careful, there's a lot of potential for that. But um, I'm interested to see mainly how he decides to itemize. Like there's a pretty standard build nowadays that's been floating around. You go like Aquila, Soul Ring. Ooh, Arteez, he actually got caught. I was gonna say he needs to just continue to try and kite around the Bloodseeker, but Ohio very smart, recognizing what the best opportunity is. He gets for the very early boots and then immediately pushes forward alongside the Undying to force Arteez to use that mana. And Klinks does have a very limited mana pool, particularly if he's spamming out Searing Arrows for CS. Yeah, that's why you have to go for the Soul Ring at some point, but... I mean, this is just an awkward situation because Arteezy always has like 300 HP because of the decay. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a rough matchup. And something we haven't talked about, I guess, is just the fact that uh, the bottom lane has been pretty successful for, I'd say, oh, and actually... Oh, wow. What? Jumping in. Mushi actually managed to get S4. I was watching the Bloodseeker get aggressive on Kuro and Arteezy at top, but uh, they managed to actually get the kill in the middle lane. Mushi coming up big. I'm not used to seeing that. Um, S4 just die like that. Yeah. And this is a matchup where I guess Queen of Pain does okay, but the Razor should also do okay. So he must have just taken too much damage from that dagger. Like, I just didn't anticipate either of them really dying here in this situation. But um, especially since S4 has a high ground ward, like, he should be able to spot the aggression coming. But um, I really want to see how that had happened. But Mushi's going to grab the top rune. And with this advantage now, like, we talked about it before, Ken, right? Like, we really emphasis. I emphasize that Mushi is one of those heroes or players that really likes to play the hero that can just solo take over a game. And I feel like he's just, just going to be pissed now. He's going to be like, we lost that last game. I wasn't able to have impact. But this game, you know, like I'm going to just go out all out. Yeah, and he's already picked up one, the early kill on the Razor, but second, uh, he has a gigantic CS advantage over S4, and that's only going to grow, especially now that he's got the extra Null Talisman, such a heavy stat build, and then uh, the Illusions as well, obviously adding a lot of right-click. S4 basically sacks some HP in order to take away that advantage, but um, is going to be forced to using his health potion here sometime soon, because again, you don't want to leave yourself too low against that Bloodseeker. It makes this top lane all the harder than it already is for Team Secret. I think Asor is going to get dived on right now. Yep, Kuro is in some serious trouble. Tombstone gets laid out. Ohio trying to go for that last right click. Kuro has nowhere to run to. In fact, oh, they, they have even have the too. dust. Arteezy's done for as well. Queen of Pain does manage to pick up the kill on S4, but Arteezy, yeah, he's going to be going down before that dust runs out. So uh, a two kills up in the top lane. Plus, they managed to take out S4 again in middle. You're absolutely right. They did dive S4. Bottom lane, uh, Snowball actually dodges the first call down shot, but the second one still hits Zai. And KYXY picks up now a fifth kill for Fnatic. Fnatic striking back big time here in game number two. They're just rolling right now. Like, I was focused on mid because I knew that Mushi was going to kill him. And then you were focused on, like, there's just so much action going on. Like, Mushi's reading the situations perfectly. Like, the fact, the thing is, is that it's easy for me to call as a caster the moves. Like, when I said he's going to dive him right here, mm -hmm. it's easier for me to see because I can see all situations at once, right? But the fact that he was able to read that situation and he makes that play is just insane to me. Because if there was any sort of TP support, the turnaround potential is high, but he decides to go for it. He reads his instincts correctly. Uh, S4 was sitting around like 600 HP and Mushi decides to just uh, YOLO in for it and he manages to pick up the kill and now this is such a significant lead because Razor, a hero like Viper, doesn't have the best flash farm potential. Like Plasma Field isn't optimal for that 
and you're picking the heroes again to win the lane, and you're no longer winning the lane whatsoever. Right. And the Queen of Pain just has so much more snowball potential than you, once she starts to build up levels especially. And if you look at Secret's lineup, they don't actually have the best way to deal with her, and so this early advantage that he's building up, is not it's not going to get better for S4 over time. He's not playing a hero like Shadow Fiend where things progressively improve. He's Razor, who's going to be pretty static in his lane. He can't fall back to the jungle or anything like that. He pretty much yeah. just has to take this level of abuse. Yeah, the one advantage that Razor is, like, sometimes has with Plasma Field is, like, farming up a, a stack, right, and trying to get the Plasma Field on both sides. Say that this stack in the hard camp, but that's not possible. Like, Keeper of the Light is very focused on jungling because what else is he going to do at this point in time? Tusk goes down again in the bottom lane as Ketch Gimba and KYXY find the opportunity, and Team Secret are rapidly running out of space here as now Fnatic are pushing aggressively up in the top lane. They've taken away that tier one tower, which you know means they're going to start making frequent invasions into the jungle. So, the one real safe harbor it seemed like for farming, which was their own jungle, is going to be taken away from them. Them sometime soon and puppy is not ready for it he's only level three he's not really ready to, to defend towers or be a part of team fights yet he's not a factor at all yeah and i did not see this shellacking coming in like any single time we turn our heads somebody from secret has died um fanatic is almost averaging a kill a minute right now and it's hard to keep up because you don't expect these deaths and fanatic just showing that they are a team to be dealt with and mm -hmm. Mushi's just having an insane game right now like he's got 41 cs with two kills both of them being solo kills and I guess it's hard to really tell, but as a mid player, dying twice solo, it's it A, hurts your confidence a lot, and B, especially since it's a solo kill, you're getting so much more experience over the other person. It's really fairly significant that uh, he continues to get solo kills more than anything, because it just makes it so hard for this Razor to catch back up into this matchup. We have Rupture now available for Ohio. He looks like he really wants to go for RTZ up here, um, but he doesn't have dust of his own. Johnny is bringing some now. Honestly, I think they should just pass off the dust to, to Ohio and leave him solo up here in this lane. Um, and that way he can pretty much always threaten RTZ by himself. He really doesn't need an extra pair of hands uh, unless RTZ has a little bit of backup behind him. But even then, I feel like if... Uh, again, with the supports that Team Secret went for, because again, I, calling them like facilitators, I think it just sticks in my mind because I think it describes them very well. They don't necessarily bring any damage themselves. Uh, so like heroes like Rubik and Keeper of the Light, even if they can stop the Bloodseeker from killing the Clinks, they won't be able to punish the Bloodseeker. Yeah, Bloodseeker or even Rubik isn't very good at holding off offenses. Like it's a hero that you want to prefer to initiate or counter initiate with, but... Mm -hmm. Against a hero like Bloodseeker, like, the two-second lift isn't really going to be able to do much, and so it's really difficult for anybody to survive. And if you that notice, like Secret are pretty much isolated on this half of the map, like they're kind of a, uh, they're kind of scared to branch out. Like they sat two heroes behind S4, but that means Arteezy can't farm, and you right. pretty much can't send anybody bottom anymore because, as we saw last game, Gyrocopter is just such a godly laner because he alone with Rocket Barrage can just pretty much kill you. And Rupture's going to go off on top, but no stuns. Yep, just forcing the TP out. That's good enough. They have the Tombstone laid out behind the tower, so this means the Creep Wave will push into this Tier 2 and doesn't seem like Team Secret many ways to be able to defend. In fact, Arteezy already forced out, and they get another kill on the Keeper of the Light, who tried to make the escape as they were farming up that hard camp. So uh, not only do they pick up the kill, the Tier 2 tower is completely forfeit. Now, Team Secret are losing all ground here by the 10-minute mark, which is insane. They actually just lost control of the jungle as well. Like we, I drew that line, right? And I was like, yep. this is the outline. Nope, can't go there anymore either, because once you lose this Tier 2 tower at top, there's actually almost nothing that's going to deter you. And if you're Fnatic, then the next target is to go for this mid tower. And then from there, you can pretty much just make night raids, you know, like every, every single time it's night, you just smoke up, go to that half, and then just let um, KYXY farm wherever he wants. And the problem right now for Secret is that none of their cores can really jungle. Like If you notice, it's still pretty much just Puppy that's going for it. And now this is this kind of feels like a desperation smoke to open the map up again. And so Arteezy is going to, you know, try to set this up. And they might actually Johnny. They actually bring a good amount of burst damage in. Almost oh, killing him. Nice sleep there. Catch again, but managed to pull out the deny. And now here comes the turnaround with Rupture already laid out. Arteezy is stuck here. And Mushi is, uh, I believe, they're going to go for some they know? damage. They're pinging. Oh, they actually. Yep, now they lay out the counter ward. Arteezy is going to be caught here. The Rupture runs out. But Mushi still able to get the kill with the last bit of nuke damage. And they also pick up the Rubik as well. So Team Fnatic. 9-2 now. So, yes, they lose the
they aren't dying, but they pick up a couple more kills, well worth the trade up by itself, but are also seemingly going to get even more of a net worth advantage by taking the tier one tower bottom lane. You can't even tell that Ohio was sent to the off lane. No, like, you that's really the can't. crazy thing. The amount of farm that he has right now. For people that aren't aware, like the fact that you have a Midas power treads and 1k gold at just 11 minutes, that's fantastic regardless of what lane you are. And another kill goes, I, ah, they are actually just being picked apart right now. Yeah, Team Secret just falling apart before our very eyes. Team Secret, who were for many the favorites of this tournament, sort of the invincible team, is actually showing, uh, I would say, some very large weakness against one of the... Um, biggest underdogs of this whole entire tournament. I think many people believe that Fnatic were Dying going to be a, a, a bottom eight team. Honestly, Fnatic just laned this really brilliantly. Like yeah. There was no real lane that you could point to and say they had an advantage. Like the first blood was nice, but at the end of the day, like I said, it was a Bloodseeker and Undying. Every single time that the Undying cast a K, Arteezy pretty much has to run away. Like that's what you saw, right? He, mm -hmm. he gets the KD has 300 HP and then the Bloodseeker just continues to farm, and any opportunity where you're low, you just die. Because the Keeper of the Light is really focused on jungling, so he can't rotate over. The Rubik is not a good defensive support whatsoever. Like, your base damage is so incredibly low, your nukes cost so much just to use to harass to begin with, so it's just way too hard for him to defend Arteezy there. And Klinks isn't one of those heroes that is self-sufficient to begin with. And at that bottom lane, Bane plus Gyrocopter. Like, if you get slept, you're dead, because you're going to get run down by Rocket Barrage every single time. So... You're just seeing complete dominance, and I mean, I'm not even covering Mushi right now because all the lanes just went so well for him. The fact that he got two solo kills on a player like S4 uh, is pretty ridiculous, and it looks like he's going to pick up something like a 15-minute Aghanim Scepter. And I think this is the right choice because he's just looking to snowball and get as far ahead as he can right now. Three man smoke up, looking to catch somebody underneath that tower, and they'll find Curl immediately. <laughs> Similar situation to game number one, except for the roles are completely reversed. Fnatic are the ones getting the successful smoke ink into that tier one and will now take it away from Team Secret. What I'd like to see right now from Fnatic is just to continue the aggression. Like I said, the next target has to be this mid tower, right? You want to just completely open up the jungle if you're Fnatic and what they're going for right now. Mushi. Oh no! Miss Sonic Wave! Mushi, uncharacteristic mistake from him, and it looks like he's going to pay for it. A blink is up. He will actually be able to make the turnaround here as the rest of the team comes in, controls the two attackers on a Mushi. Tusk, as well as the Razor. Now they're going to go for Kuro as well. Came in with the TP, but will immediately go down. Double kill for Mushi. Three out from Team. Team Secret, and that Tier 1 tower is going to be forfeit. They just can't survive right now. Like, the fights that Secret took right there were pretty ideal. They were under a tower, but the Coddle gets hit by one thing. The Bloodseeker then has 450 move speed, and then he's running around, two-tapping people, and the aggression right now that they're laying on. Like, I'd like to see a Shadow Blade or something like that from Ohio. Um, or I guess he's going to go for the Yasha. Oh, this is going to be an S and Y then. Like, but I would like to just see continued aggression, like non-stop around the map. Yeah. I thought a Shadow Blade would be okay in this situation, just so you can continue to uh, put up pressure and make the supports poor. But S and Y is just as good because there's no burst damage on Secret. So if you go for an S and Y, there's nothing really that's going to kill you immediately. I feel like yeah. going for a BKB this early isn't worth it. But they really have Secret have to make something happen. Like they're giving up a kill a minute. Fnatic are actually keeping that pace. Like I said it early game, and you know, it was like 7 to 1 at 7 minutes. Oh, but catch again. Up, uh, good style to come out from Ohio, though. Perhaps this can set up Ohio to go for some kills. In fact, sure enough, he already stuns coming forward, but the blinding light is there, and Ohio immediately has to back himself away from that. Kuro, though, is going to be cleaned up now as Mushi comes in. They still brought a couple of heroes low. Team Secret are on the retreat back to their Tier 2 tower. So one for one trade off. Fnatic seemingly not going to back down from a fight just yet. They are going to keep on pushing forward. Still, though, they're pushing into a keeper of the light. No matter how far ahead they are, they do need to be careful of that constant pushback damage. Yeah, that was a good smoke, but even in the best of situations, you're trading one for one there, and so uh, you do have to get away with a little bit more than that, especially in a smoke ink. But if you're in a position where you're this far behind, then the better move is to simply just go for um, any kill that you can. Like, a trade is okay here, and I didn't even realize how absurd the net worth lead was, but we yeah. should definitely at least... <laughs> like, that's... For 15 minutes into the game, for them to build up that sort of lead, they're getting up 1,000 gold per minute over Seeker right now. Pretty insane stuff, and with... It always happens, right? When you've got this kind of control, 
it just naturally built into more and more and more. So as they get uh, all these kills, they're getting more towers, they start getting more aggra map aggressive vision, and situations like this occur, where Kuro is spotted out, putting both his sentry here, and they now see that he's missing one of his wards, so very presumably they're going to know that it's some sort of uh, top river ward that was placed by Kuro, that the map vision is going to be very few and far between for Team Secret, and they just are going to be forced into playing very grouped up and very defensively. Sure enough, Ketchikimba already takes away that river ward, and we'll also make sure he takes that uh, bounty rune as well. Yeah, Fnatic right now are just eating up all the space that Secret have, and Secret's lineup just was not designed to get behind at any phase of the game. Because you're seeing right now what's going on is that the Razor and the Clinks are just farming these neutral oh. camps, but they're doing it so slowly. Poor Zai gets caught out by the Fiend's Grip with the double damage on Mushi. No need to use Sonic Wave when you have that kind of advantage. You, you know it's a it's a free kill if Mushi, if the Queen of Pain with Aghanim Scepter isn't willing to blow Sonic Wave for Yeah, she's like, I really don't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's got a low enough cooldown, but she's like, I just really don't want to use the mana. And I may find another kill in the next 30 seconds. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Godlike spree already for Mushi at 17 minutes as he finds another pick off this time on Kuro. Yeah, this is, again, going back to what we talked about. Like, this is what Mushi can do to your team. He's just getting solo pick offs left and right. And it's just brutal right now. Like, Secret are trying to scramble. They're trying to farm out whatever they can and buy RTZ some time so that he can start the split push game. Because that's their, that's their main hope back into this game right now. Especially with the lead that's built up. Because Fnatic, all they're going to have to do right now is go for the Roshan. And then they can pretty much play it safe and continue to play put that stranglehold on a secret because all three of your cores are so farmed that they're self-sufficient and independent at this point that they don't have to play together at any phase anymore right. because it's too hard for Mushi to die right now because looking at Secret's lineup they don't have enough lockdown the Bloodseeker and the Gyrocopter can just turn things around so as long as one support is with them then it becomes way too difficult to do anything so if you're Secret the ideal standard right now is just to continue to farm out the jungle however you can but just look how slow it is for this Razor yeah Razor doesn't have many options RTC of course is going to farm out the jungle a bit faster but you're right S4 He's still operating on pretty much just upgraded boots. He's got a Bracer, Wraith Ban, and Bottle with him, but not even like a mid-game item being had by him just yet. Fnatic making invasion into the jungle, are going to grab Zai immediately. He will be the first one out. Tombstone was laid down as well, so Team Secret need to try and get away from this one. Puppy couldn't even complete his TP out. Fnatic take out two and perhaps a third. Yep, Clinks. He also falls. Mushi finds him. And that will be a one, two, three and push into tier two tower. Fnatic, it seems like we're just going to see a straight up GG soon. Yeah, they're, at this point, Secret just, there's nowhere for them to farm anymore. And, you know, they're making the right steps to try to come back into this game, but it's the limitations of the lineup right now, I feel, where they just, none of their cores can really go to the jungle. Like, Tusk isn't a hero that's going to come back from the jungle, nor is Clinks, nor is Razor. Like, those are heroes that depend on tower gold and building up an advantage and being able to parlay that in a, into, uh, into just pickoffs. But right now, we're just seeing Fnatic just take complete control of the game. This is what you wanted to see out of them last game, but this game, I mean, things are completely different just because of how well Mushi is playing. Like, I don't even think this is Secret playing inherently terribly in any sort of situation. It's just that Mushi is just doing whatever he wants with them. Like, I, I, fe I really feel like he's just mad. He's saying to himself, like, why did I even bother, like, losing that last game? Like, I'm Mushi. Like, I get to do whatever I want. <laughs> And now with the Nagonims and upcoming Octarine Core, he's going to have a 30 second cooldown on his Sonic Wave. And, and Blink also goes to an absurd like 4.5 4 seconds or something like that. Like it just becomes uh, a hero that's all over the place and has nukes constantly. And with the level advantage he still has over Team Secret, just going to be blowing up heroes left and right. Bloodseeker, of course is uh, still quite a happy camper. He's got Hannah Midas, SNY, 2,400 gold. We still haven't even gotten to the period of time where Hannah Midas has paid for itself yet. So as just goes to show as this game goes on, uh, Ohio's going to be raking in even more items and even larger of a net worth lead over Team Secret than they already have. I mean, if you just look at the core positions, uh, pretty much every single core of Fnatic has double the net worth of the respective core from Team Secret. Yeah, and the thing is, Ohio is buying wards for his supports now, so they can get farmed now. Like, he's just like, don't worry guys, I got this, and the net worth lead is pretty steady, but you can see some comeback potential. I mean, I think I was watching, like, the end of the Cloud9 game, 
and they were up two sets of racks in like 20k and so this type of lead isn't insurmountable by any means it's just that the road to getting there right now is quite hard because of how Fnatic's playing like they're playing really close to the vest they're not forcing anything like they even ha they haven't even tried to breach high ground to go for the Roshan right now what they're relying on more than anything is complete map control and dominance and I feel like they're just trying to crush secret spirits Oh, look at this. Ketchigimba. He set himself up quite the nice little trap here. He four stepped up into the trees and set down both a, a ward and counter ward. Radiant's and he's ready to go with a uh, Fiend's Grip hold or sleep and then Fiend's Grip. Just any sort of delaying factor to get his allies to come over and help him out. I think he's just clowning. Like, he was just trying to four staff over the hill in case anybody was nearby, but it's pretty irrelevant. I think what Fnatic should do is go for the Roshan, and I feel like what Secret should do in response is just try to pressure this top tower as much as they can, as quick as they can. Because there's no way that you're going to contest that Rosh fight. Like, I feel like that's, that's yeah, it's just a death sentence. None of your team has farm right now. There's just no point in dueling the net worth. Like, go for the split push at top. Try to do whatever you can. Like, I think... Um, that's like the better play overall. Mm -hmm. Radiance top tower. Play as defensive as humanly possible. Try and draw out the game later and later. And if Fnatic want to try and force it, just hope they make mistakes and push in the process of pushing uphill. Yeah, exactly. Because that can definitely happen in a game of Dota. Nobody's really perfect, and so it's not ideal to rely on the mistakes of your opponents. But it's still better than what's happening right now. Arteezy gonna be hit by that fiend grip. Mushi pops the ultimate. Arteezy will walk away with just the slightest bit of HP left. Mushi still has a blink though. Will catch Arteezy in the end. The dust fades, but unfortunately he's too low. The Bloodseeker uh, passive still spies him out, and Fnatic get yet another kill for now. Beyond Godlike spree for Queen of Pain. Yeah, he's 11 and 0 right now. He's had such a sick game. And with this, I'm pretty sure it's going to be an Octarine Core because if he was going to go for the Blessing, he would have had it. That means, can you really lock down the Queen of Pain for four seconds? Like, I don't even think Secret's lineup has that much Disable on it. Like, the lift is for two. 1.5 like oh jesus moose is just jumping in my god All he's right. just trying to force something he doesn't even have the, he's not even the one with the aegis i thought for a second there i i misread who grabbed the aegis and it was actually mushi but no mushi's just like whatever i'm gonna jump in there don't care uh and he still manages to get out despite the fact that he didn't have octarine core yet his allies help him out with a couple of defensive four staffs and he is good to go yeah, it's actually insane that he's just allowed to blink there. And if you notice, um, Secret's wards, though, they're still placing good wards. They have vision in areas that they need to, where they think they're going to get assaulted from. But right now, if you look at Fnatic's wards, uh, I guess we don't talk about wards enough in general. But the way that they're warding is just to strangle Secret. It's just to kind of cut off wherever farm angles they can go for. Like, this makes it so that nobody can farm the Ancients and they can't go for the Roche attempt. This is the entrance to the jungle, which is a lot more safe because you notice there's already a preemptive ward there, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're just continuing to ward in places so that there's nowhere that Secret feels safe. Like, yeah. before you even leave the base, you're being cut off. Like, look at Arteezy's options right now. He's trying to farm the enemy Ancients because he realizes, like, if there's a ward in this area and he gets picked off, then that's a free Roshan yeah. and a kill. Yeah, especially like the fact that he's coupling the wards. Mushi, there's no way he dies here, right? He's got to blink up in a second. Ooh, that was actually closer than I expected, but goes to show the power of Clinks. Now, Ohio is going to have some slight issues. They actually brought S4 back. They can easily get this kill, but Ohio gets the four staff away, and he still had a bit of mana left. I was going to say earlier that uh, uh, Puppy, the Keeper of the Light, is a decent, like, very, very soft but he is a counter to the Bloodseeker in that he has both Blinding Light, which is good at being able to just stop the Bloodseeker's damage, which is obviously a priority in right clicks, and then also his Mana Link, which is quite good because Bloodseeker relies on his innate mobility when people are at low HP. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, Bloodseeker, or, um, or Keeper of the Light, is just... It's just an annoying hero to play against. Like, once yeah. there's four staffs in the game and stuff like that, you can use the Blinding Knight Light and just, like, triple mana off, but... Oh, go. Mushi gets a three-man Sonic wave. The Snowball manages to save the Keeper of the Light for the time being, but it only provides a slight moratorium in his death. 
again. Fnatic, the crazy thing is they haven't even gone for Roshan. Like, how often... Or actually, they have, but... Yeah. Um, it took them so long to do it originally that they don't even need it to go high ground, is what I mean. Like, this, it's pretty unnecessary at this point, because... Yeah, normally you would wait for the next Roshan before you try and push uphill, right? But it, Fnatic are just so far ahead, they're gonna go uphill with the first Roshan. Yeah, they're just... At this point, they don't really care. Like, I think even without the Roshan, it's just absolutely securing it in S4. Last Bastion of Defense. Yeah, he tries to back himself away, but he just runs himself to death with a rupture on top. Gyrocopter secures that last hit. Kuro running forward straight into the tombstone. Doesn't really care. Fnatic, though, very much focused on objective gaming. They've taken out the mid lane of Rax and immediately slide on up to the top lane, not wanting to give Team Secret any room to be able to make a comeback. So it seems, well, Team Secret, they're still going to try and fight this one out. They do not have the Razor. Klinks now has a Desolator ready to go, but the Tier 3 tower is about to fall. Another Blast gets laid out and does bring at least KYX wide low. He still has that Aegis. Good to go, though. Zai going to be slowed down, actually forced to snowball there because he didn't want to get hit by the Silence. S4 now come to the foray, the ultimate. And the pushback there is able to get the Gyrocopter down. S4 comes forward. They managed to clean up one already. S4 drops quite low, but they can't pursue him out. Fnatic are still healthy as a full five-man crew and are able to finish up that melee at Rax. And seems like they're going to be able to stick around for the range racks as well as Team Secret only operating with three heroes right now. KYXY takes just one shot before immediately there's a response from Team Fnatic. Slow down RTZ and make him asleep. The homing missile comes in, bonks him up, but... Fnatic don't care. They've taken that second lane of racks and will immediately back up to refuel and probably pick up a couple of items before they now go for Megas. Yeah, you can even wait for the Roshan if you absolutely want to secure this game. And that might actually be what they shoot to go for because you just want to make absolute sure that this isn't a game that you lose. Yeah. Like Fnatic have done everything that they possibly can to secure this game. I think the net worth lead has to be at least 30k. Yeah, it is. It might even be a little <laughs> bit greater than that once the time passes and... I mean, the farm advantage alone is just so hard to come back from, and uh, Secret had to expend like what three buybacks there, and they weren't even able to hold Rex. So when you're able, when you're doing that, it just continues to kind of shut you out. And Secret are going to go for the smoke gank, but this is like you have to get something out of this. This is a super YOLO maneuver. They know that Kuchik is right here, and he actually manages to get himself away at the same time. Yeah, the good play there, being able to. Uh... Glimmer back himself away. KYXY is going to respond, though. He's got his BKB. Turns and fights the rest of the team. Good snowball out. Zion's just trying to give them away from that call down area. But Mushi cleans him up with a huge Sonic Wave. GG. Team Secret are done with this game. Incredibly one sided win for Team Fnatic. Uh, even more one sided than our first game that went to Team Secret. Quite the weird event. Like, turn of events that just happens there, that Team Secret has such a dominant showing in game number one, and that's sort of the way the storyline was meant to unfold, and then Fnatic strike back incredibly hard in game number two with just a really 